Okay, we're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech Community Matters here on a given Monday morning. And we are joined by Rabbi Itchel Krasnjanski of Chabad of Hawaii. Welcome to the show, Rabbi. Nice to have you here. Good morning, Jay. It's my pleasure as always. Nice to be here. You look so ethereal. You, you know, the, the, the Zoom makes you look pretty good. You look like a real, a real ethereal rabbi, Rabbi. <laughs> the, 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 the whole... The goal is to look that way in real life. <laughs> <laughs> well, you look that way in real life, too. Yeah, so I wanted to talk to you about um, an article which was in um, Haaretz this morning, um, a piece by a rabbi in New Jersey where he said that uh, you know, all this virtual communication, virtual mm, prayer meetings, virtual you know congregational meetings of Jewish temples in Israel and in the U.S. and probably everywhere um, is not good for Judaism. Because Judaism is a Judaism is, is a touchy feely kind of religion. You got to be together. The whole notion of a minion, the whole notion of um, you know enjoying the company of the other members of the of the of the congregation um, is a problem. And um, he said, uh, you know, this this works for a while. It's a it's a blush thing, but after a while, it's going to be damaging to the religion. What do you think about that? Well, uh, I think that's true. Uh, you know, it's, it's, the, it's the discussion uh, that didn't just begin now, but the discussion of, you know, people who live online as opposed to people who are out there and interacting with people. Uh, you know, uh, people on Facebook have lots of friends, but in real life don't. So, um, I think ultimately life is meant to be lived in real, <clears throat> in real time, uh, interacting with people, like you say, touch, touchy feely. And this interaction with people is really what uh, gets us going. It sparks, it sparks, uh, you know, a reaction within us. That's, that's the basis of all society. And, uh, you know, it's interesting. In the Hebrew language, the word for city, like a city, as opposed to a village, in Hebrew, the word is ir. In English, you would spell it I-Y-R, ir. Now, in, in Hebrew also, you know, I don't, I don't know the exact term for the study of words, you know, what are the meaning of words and how do words, how do words come to mean what they mean? But the root of the word city, ear, is very similar to the word in Hebrew, ayar. Ayar means, I'm sorry, air. Air means to be awake and alive. So in a city, when you have the multitude of people, inter multitude, multitude of people interacting with one another, uh, then you become alive. You know, all revolutions happen in big cities. Very seldom do they happen in, you know, in suburbia, where everyone is into their, you know, encosted in their, you know, in their homes. So, obviously, long term, even in Jewish law, in halacha, in Jewish law, uh, we need to have a congregation in order for many, many things. Most basic is, like you mentioned, a minion, a quorum, in order to say the prayers, to say the Kaddish, we need to have a quorum. And a virtual quorum, halakhically, is not uh, considered a quorum. So you couldn't say Kaddish on Zoom, through Zoom, by gathering 10 people or 100 people. Can you, can you tell people what a Kaddish is? Yes. Kaddish is the mourner's prayer that... Um, that, that you say for those who have passed away in Jewish tradition for the first uh, 11 months after someone has passed away, a family member, a parent, or primarily a parent, uh, you say the special prayer, which, is, which begins with the words, Yiskada v'yiskada shemei rabba. May God's name be uh, magnified and enlarged. It's, it's primarily a a, a prayer of praise to God and the explanation that is given why it doesn't even mention 
uh, depth in this prayer of Kaddish. But when a person comes, confronts death, comes face to face to death, then the real, the, the only consolation is, uh, is, is, is recognizing that God, uh, who's the, who's, who scripts everything in this world, gives us life and decides when, you know, when one moves on to the other world. So that's the prayer of Kaddish. And that mm-hmm. prayer requires a minion, 10 people. Now, what's interesting, what's done practically, you know, even like in New York, I know because I'm from New York, so I talk to the folks back home. People gather together, people from the same block come out on their porches. You know, every house has a porch. That's how they build the houses in Brooklyn. I, I'm not sure. I'm sure in Queens, similar to that. People stand on their porches, so they're more than six feet apart. As long as you can see each other and hear each other, that constitutes a quorum. You don't have to be in close proximity for a minion to happen. So that's how they do it. But, but it has to be real time. It cannot be virtual. Having said that, I think that the, the fact that we have this opportunity when everything is shut down, and when we can gather together, when we cannot gather together, uh, in, in, in real in real time, um, so this is a blessing that we can talk and people can stay together, people families, and uh, there is more learning, studying Torah going on today through Zoom as a result of everything that's happening more than any other time. And people just plug in and they study and uh, it's, uh, it's actually fantastic. Yeah. But then as this rabbi in New Jersey says, uh, uh, it's more than just the studying. You, you pass a culture down by, by being close to people and you have um, freewheeling conversations with them and uh, you ask them questions that are sort of personal and you get answers that are that is sort of profound at the moment. And um, this is another part of education, another part of acculturation and, and so forth. So um, coming up later this month, Rabbi, um, we have uh, Shavu- Shavuos. Now, when I was a kid, we pronounced it Shavuos, just like we pronounced uh, the, 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 the Sabbath, sh- sh- Shabbos, Shabbos. I guess that's the Ashkenazic trend, uh, 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 way of saying it, but... Um, there's there's um, there's also the Sephardic way of saying it, and that that would be uh, Shabbat, and it would be Shvuat, Shvuat. Yeah? Um, what's the difference? How did this happen? Well, that's interesting. You know, biblically, Jewish people were divided by tribes. Our forefather Jacob had twelve children, and they formed the twelve tribes of Israel. The children had families and large families, and all throughout their uh, all throughout their uh, their being in Egypt and traveling in the desert for forty years, the Jewish people were uh, were identified by the tribes. Even till today, you have a Kohen and a Levite and an Israelite. The Kohen and the Levi. The Kohen and the Levite are from the tribe of Levi, Levi, that during the times of the temple would serve in the temple. They would bring the sacrifices and, and do service in the temple. So any descendants of uh, the tribe, any person who's a descendant of the tribe of Levi, Levi, is a Kohen or a Levi. And on the Sabbath or the holidays, when we take out the Torah scroll and we read from the Torah scroll, the first uh, honor is given to the Kohen. The Kohen Aliyah gets called up to the Torah. So we still have that. Now, as you know... So your, your name can be Kohen, and that would signify you come from a lineage of Kohen. And right. your name can be Levi, right. uh, and that would signify you come from uh, the lineage of Levi. But... But um, but you don't have to be named Co- Cohen to be a Kohen, and you don't have to be named Le- Levi Levi to be a Levi to be Levi. No? Right, right. So, for example, but there are names that are 
that you know that uh, are more associated with a coin or a lady. So, for example, in the name family name Sego or Siegel, which is a common name, Jewish common name, in, in Hebrew is an abbreviation for Sagan Levi. So, which means the Levi, which was an assistant. So the role of the Levi was to be uh, an assistant to the Kohen. So if someone's name is Sigo, uh, very often they are from the tribe of Levi. So, but then as you, as you, as you go through history, during the times of the first temple, uh, the Babylonian king, when he exiled, when he destroyed the first temple, the Bukha when he destro destroyed the first temple, prior to destroying the first temple, he exiled the 10, 10 of the 12 tribes were exiled from Israel. And, and that is, quote unquote, the lost 10 tribes. What was left are the tribe of Judah and Benjamin. That's why the Jewish people were, are called Judeans, in Hebrew, Yehudi, because uh, we are, Jews today are descendants primarily from the tribe of Judah and Benjamin. But then later on, after the, the destruction of the second temple, when the Jews were uh, exiled from Israel again, and this time they were scattered throughout the nations of the world, so many Jews went to the Middle Eastern countries, ended up in the Middle Eastern countries, Iraq, Iran, Morocco, places like that. And many Jews uh, went to Europe, but countries like Spain, Iberia, but many other Jews found their way to uh, Germany and those Eastern European countries. So Ashkenaz uh, in Hebrew is Germany. So the descendants of German Jews or, and its satellite countries, Eastern Europe, are called Ashkenazic Jews. Uh, Sephard is the Hebrew word for Spain. So the Jews coming from Spain and the Middle Eastern countries are called Sephardic Jews. And today, because we don't know what tribe we're from, so Jews are generally divided between Ashkenazic and Sephardic Jews. We have different ways of pronoun pronouncing, pr pronouncing the, the Hebrew letters. Like you said, either Shabbos, the Ashkenazic way, or Shabbat, the Sephardic way. Uh, but what's interesting is modern Hebrew in the land of Israel, one of the great miracles of the land of Israel is that the Hebrew language, which was dead for 2,000 years when the Jews were exiled in every country of the world and spoke the language of their respective host countries, and very few people spoke Hebrew. It wasn't, it wasn't a, a, a language that people spoke. With the creation of Israel, uh, it's become a, um, a spoken language, and that is the official language of the state of Israel. Anyone who is from Israel speaks English, mm -hmm. speaks Hebrew. Yeah. By the way, um, as as I read somewhere, which is it's un it's pr it's unprecedented that a language should be dead for two thousand years and then to spring to life and become the official language of a country. There's no other language. Right, and, and everybody in Israel is so articulate in it, and uh, it's quite it's amazing. Language. But you don't, you don't mind if I ask you, now we, we don't have that much time left, uh, what about uh, Shavuos? What is it? It's a holiday at the end of, uh, as I recall, the end of May. It's 50 days after Passover. I'm not sure why the 50 days. Okay. Um, and it's not, uh, it's not a high holiday. Uh, right. But it is an important holiday. Can you talk right. about it? Yes. So Shavuos in Hebrew means weeks. Um, and why is it called weeks? Because the Torah says, says in the Bible, that seven weeks after the Jewish people left Egypt, they were meant to bring a sacrifice, an offering in the temple, and to celebrate the holiday. So the holiday is called Shavuos. But the main thing that happened on the holiday of Shavuos is that we received the, 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 uh, the Torah, the Ten Commandments. Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the Ten Commandments. 
And that happened on the holiday of Shavuot. So basically, in the Torah, there are three biblical holidays. Uh, the first one is Passover. The second one is Shavuot. And Shavuot in English is called uh, Pentecost, I think which means 50. And then you have the festival of Sukkot, the Feast of the Tabernacles. And there's a, there's a, a rhyme and a theme uh, of all these holidays. On Passover, we celebrate our freedom. Right? The Jewish people, while they were in Egypt, were enslaved. And Moses led the Jewish people out of Egypt. God took us out of Egypt and made us into a free nation, a free people. But freedom, in order for it to be meaningful, has to have direction and purpose. If a person doesn't have a purpose or direction, then freedom is actually a very, very dangerous tool because then you're free to do whatever and including destructive stuff, right? So Passover is just the beginning of our journey. Immediately after Passover, seven weeks later, we received our mandate. We received our uh, marching orders. The Ten Commandments. This is the Torah, the Ten Commandments. This is the Jewish mandate, our mission statement in this world. <laughs> And that would not be possible without Passover, without the freedom of Pass uh, that, that Passover celebrates. Mm -hmm. However, Passover without Shavuot is, 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 is meaningless because freedom, in order for it to be meaningful, has to, is a context for purpose and, 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 and direction. And then we have the festival of Sukkot, the tabernacle because uh, that represents the trust that we had in God, that when we left Egypt, even though we had no provisions and no housing, nevertheless, we followed Moses into the desert based on our trust in God. So trust in God is the other pillar in Jewish life. It's, it's one thing to receive the Torah, but in order for it to become a living document, it requires for us to have faith and trust in its teachings. And that's mm -hmm. how all the three biblical holidays comprise this idea. Well, a, there is an interesting trilogy there because uh, you need all three. You yes. can't just have the law handed down to you. Right. And by the way, this is sort of an extraordinary coincidence that May, which is the month of Shavuos, yes. is also you know, Law Day. In fact, Law oh. Day is right now. Wow. And uh, May 1st, and, and um, you know, I, a lot of, a lot by of people the way, can, yeah. Jay, I'm sorry to interrupt, but you're an attorney, so tell me if you, if you have ever heard this. I heard this from an attorney that said to, told me once that our law in the United States is based on British law, common law. And there is in common law, in British law, I forget the term, it's a Latin term, but when there, is, um, when there is ambiguity and it's not clear what the law is, then you fall back on Talmudic law. <laughs> I hadn't heard that. But, you know, indeed, Talmudic law has to be part of the whole, you know, evolution of law. It existed a long time ago. And undoubtedly, there are pieces of it, uh, you know, that, that, that paid forward. Um, I hadn't heard it, but it sounds not unreasonable to me. So anyway, so, so the thing about the trust I find very interesting, especially in our times, because you cannot have um, a society of laws unless you trust in the laws. And in this case, the laws came, you know, the, the Jewish laws, the Torah and Ten Commandments, came from God. They were handed down to Moses. Um, and so I... You know, I think the, the third of those holidays is the, is the, is the glue that binds, the one that uh, gives life to the laws that says, you know, you, you will all trust the larger, you know, the larger scheme of things, God, yourselves. Um, you know, as George Washington said, uh, the true administration of justice is the firmest, firmest pillar of good government. Well, that, that really means that people have trust in the way things are being done. The social compact, if you will. Sure. I think that's what you're talking about uh, when you're talking about that third sure. holiday. Correct. Uh, 
Uh, if I can just say uh, something very interesting, two points. One is that it's, it's, it's fascinating that the Jewish people have become a nation when we receive God's law, when we receive the Torah and Shavuos. Every other nation in the world begins with the land. They, they share a country, they share a, a, a you know, geography, a country. And then you need to have laws to govern how to live. So the law comes after the nation is born. In Judaism, the law precedes us being a nation and the law cements us being a nation. Because, because the, the Jewish people really represent an idea and a, te a teaching. It's almost like America. America is based on ideals. The Constitution is based on certain truths. And that's the bedrock of our society. The only other nation that is like that is the Jewish nation, that our identity and our, uh, our identity as a nation was cemented on the holiday of Shavuos when we received our marching orders, the law, God's words. That's one thing. Another interesting point is the Torah tells us that, that God came down to Mount Sinai and Moses went up the mountain and Moses came down 40 days later with the Ten Commandments and this was in the presence of 600,000 Jewish men from the age of 60 to from 20 to 60. And with women and children, was over several million people were present when God came down to Mount Sinai. In other words, the commentaries explain that Jewish religion is not based on faith. That you believe what Moses told us. It's based on a historical truth. That God came down in the presence of all the people, as opposed to other religions like Christianity, for example, where Jesus was with his disciples and then went off to on his own and came back and said that he had a revelation and God revealed himself to him and told him what he told him. So it's either you believe him or not. It requires faith to accept Christianity. In Judaism, it doesn't re require faith. It was a historical fact in the presence of millions of people. Mm -hmm. If that was not true, if that never happened, then it would have come down to us in history that the Torah makes this claim, but other people said that it never happened. For example, we know that George Washington was real and he lived not based on faith, we know it as a historical fact, because if George Washington was a myth, it would come down to us in history books that some people claim he was real and some people claim he was, uh, wasn't. Well, sometimes truth has a way of being um, perverted. But let me, let me ask you this, though. Um, we only have a, a minute or two left. Um, how do we celebrate Shavuos? It's not a holiday that calls upon us to, to fast or spend the whole day in the temple. Um, but there are things that we are supposed to do on Shavuos. What are they? Right. So, uh, first of all, on the holiday itself, on the day of Shavuos, uh, when we gather in the temple, in the synagogues, we read the Ten Commandments. And that's a way of accepting upon ourselves every year the Ten Commandments. Uh, it's also there's some very interesting customs related to Shavuos. And that is that every holiday and every, uh, every Shabbos, we have a Shabbos meal and usually it's uh, meat or chicken or whatever. On Shavuos, we have a dairy dairy meal. We eat cheese blintzes, if you, recall, if you know what that is. Of course. And Everyone knows cheese blintzes, don't they? <laughs> and uh, the reason for that is because we, uh, when we received the Torah, we were like new newly born. And babies eat dairy. They, eat, they, 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 they nourish from their mother's milk. So that's one of the reasons why we eat uh, dairy on Shavuos. Some people are up the entire night prior studying the Torah. Uh, but it's a very, very celebratory uh, holiday. And it, it's a reaffirmation. When God came to the Jewish people and, and Moses came to the Jewish people and said that God wants to give us the Torah, we said, we will accept, we will do, and we will listen. 
meaning that the foundation was a, a we will accept it even before we know what says what, what it says inside it's not based on our understanding our acceptance is not based on our understanding our acceptance is based on our faith and trust in god so shuas is a very important holiday this year we'll probably have to celebrate it each one uh shuttered in their homes but uh, what's interesting uh, with that is there was the, ten, the beginning of the Ten Commandments begins with God says, I am the Lord your God who has taken you out of Egypt. Uh, and the word, as the commentaries uh, point out, is in the singular. Even though the God was talking to millions of people, so why does he say use the singular and not the collective? Because the truth is that even though the Torah was given to everyone, everyone has a personal relationship with God. Everyone it speaks to everyone on a very personal level. So in that context, being at home and reflecting on what the Torah uh, informs you personally and your personal journey through life is really what the celebration of Shavuos is all about. Yeah, but it strikes me talking with you, Rabbi, that Shavuos is, is actually law day. It was the handing down of the law uh, to Moses and to the people of Israel uh, in the desert. Uh, Mount Sinai, am I right? That's where it was. And, and um, so that, that is really very similar to uh, the celebration of law in, in, in um, the American tradition. Okay. It's a celebration. For, but, you know, and, and, but you need that third holiday, Juos. Uh, I'm sorry, what is it, the third one? Oh, Sukkot. Sukkot, that's in the fall. That's not for months yet. Exactly. Uh, so Sukkot binds it together exactly. and, and reconfirms that people are buying in. Um, that they they trust God and and they trust the Torah and the law. It all comes together and it's the perfect time for it, Rabbi. Thank you, Jay. Always. Well, I wish you well here uh, approaching Sukkot and we'll talk again in a few weeks and yes. and catch Looking up forward. on whatever else is new. And uh, I, I, I hope that uh, Chabad, as all the temples, uh, fares well under the, under the, uh, the shutdown. Um, and that um, we all find a way to um, be close to each other, uh, you know, despite uh, the distancing. The best way to describe what's going on is, uh, it's like when you go through the mall and there's a big sign that says closed for renovations. So this is what God is doing. He's shutting everything down because he's renovating the world. <laughs> so coming out on the other side, it can be a new world. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be a new world in so many ways, Rabbi. That's, that's so wise. <laughs> well, thank you very much, much yeah, Rabbi. Rabbi Itchel Krasnjanski of Chabad of Hawaii. Thank you for joining us, and we'll talk again soon. Aloha. Thank you. Be well. Thank you.